please welcome Yanni Evakaliu. Thank you. Is this on? You can you hear me? Yep. Um, thanks, Robbie, for introducing me. Um, thanks uh, for having me here. I've spoken at the meetups before. The meetups are great, and, and like, you should do meetup talks. Um, and people ask me why, and my answer is that you get free water. So that's pretty balls. Um, so yeah, my name is Yanni. Um, I come from Finland. I currently work at Formidable Labs here in London, uh, where my job is basically to build cool stuff in JavaScript. Um, and uh, much like Cheng Lu, uh, I have also recently discovered keynote animations, and I'm not afraid to use them. Um, so yeah, what I want to hear talk about is offline, and I'm going to start with a, a short story. So um, two years ago, um, I built my first mobile app uh, with React Native, and and it was like a real app. You could you know touch it, you could swipe it. It even had like like Tindery thing that you could do that everybody loves. Um, not for the sex part, but for the uh, you know for the swiping part. Um, and I was really happy with myself being a web developer, somebody who saw myself as a web developer uh, at that time, uh, to be able to ship a mobile app just like that. Um, and I was really happy until we actually put this into use and people started using it. And the feedback we started getting, why is this app telling me that I have no network connectivity? I can't access the server. I don't care about that. I just want to see my pictures. So it turns out that we actually missed like one really important part of, of, of mobile um, user experience. We made it look like a real app, but it, didn't, um, it wasn't built with network resiliency in mind. So I kind of got obsessed with this idea of how do we build offline first apps with React. Um, and that's my topic today. But so you might wonder, why is this guy here in 2017? The story is two years old. He's basically just humble bragging on stage. Um, why, why, like my employer paid good money for me to be here. Uh, why am I listening to this story? So the thing is that offline support is really, um, really important today, and it's something that's just going to uh, get more important. Um, because basically of service worker, or the new progressive web app APIs that basically enable websites to behave like mobile apps. Um, and in one important regard, um, they can work offline, and they should. So many of you, um, who are web developers today, I bet, will be writing mobile apps soon. It doesn't mean that you're doing React Native. You'll be still doing browser stuff. Um, but there will be new things and new patterns that you will have to learn, um, just like I did. So basically what I want to um, tell here today uh, are things that I learned the hard way, and maybe you don't have to. But there's another thing about, um, about offline that what really matters today. Um, and that's because the world is getting more and more connected. Today, one billion people have access to high-speed internet. Three billion people have access to internet, period. And there's five billion people who own a mobile device, not all of them connected to the internet. Um, and these uh, people, for them, offline support is not um, you know, a luxury. It's, it's a question of, of basic accessibility. Um, and okay, so. It's a hard sell for you to go to your boss and go, OK, uh, this guy told me that we need to make an, an app offline because somebody on the world over needs to be able to use it, right? Like, that's a, that's a hard sell. But here's the thing. Like, the slides is emerging markets. Um, and, and today, those, you know, those, those 3 billion people with access to the internet, 5 billion people, uh, more and more people are graduating the internet, and they also graduate the middle class. And for businesses, those are your next users. Um, you don't know where, in the in, in internet business, you may not know where your users come from. But let's say, hypothetically, that you're building, um, like you just don't care about it. Like maybe you're building a local app. Um, you know that your users are here in London. Um, you know, why should you care? Or maybe you're like that kind of Brexit type individual that everything foreign just makes you like super scared and confused. Um, <laughs> And, and you're willing to throw away perfectly good money just not to have to deal with it. Um, I was really expecting a bigger laugh on that one. Um, <laughs> so let's say, let's say um, you know, this is your kind of point of view. But the thing is that even in here, like at home, um, offline first apps are worth building. Um, because even like in 3G, 4G, latency is still a terrible, uh, like, you know, a terrible user experience a lot of the time. And uh, fundamentally, there's a lot of situations 
um, like here in the tube, where two million people get on these tubes every day, um, and they don't have internet access, and nothing better to do than swipe their phones. So um, offline support can um, you know, help us get democratized access to the internet. It can, um, it can you know, help you make more money. And finally, it can actually just improve the user experience for existing users here at home. Um, so, but this is a React conference. So let's talk about briefly about, you know, what is it, you know, like how do we build offline first apps with React? So I said, um, like I, I got obsessed with it and I've built a few apps now with offline support uh, in mind. And there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of requirements that arise. Uh, and uh, Andre, really helpfully in the morning, already introduced most of these topics, so I don't have to. Um, but basically, it boils down to a couple of things. Um, it's networking, a network resilience, like working um, reliably under poor network conditions. And then it's about persistence, about storing your state, being able to um, um, you know, get to it later. And then there's a lot of details around things like background sync, around versioning um, your state when your app updates, but your state is persistent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I wanted a solution that um, it was easy for us to use as developers to take into use because there's enough complexity, inherent complexity in building offline first applications. Um, we don't want the accidental complexity of also taking in like, uh, like, um, like, like a solution that brings its own baggage. I wanted something that works with any backend. Like at Formidable, we are a consultancy. Um, we build uh, usually things that integrate into systems architectures that we have no control over. So I, I wanted a solution that I can use in my job. Like Cheng Lu was saying, um, feeling depressed about not being able to use his own, own, uh, own uh, things in, in production. I wanted something that I could. I wanted something that would be familiar to all React developers. So when we onboard new people on the team, we don't need to go into um, like a, a you know onboarding camp in order to do that, and and finally um, I'm really hard trying to coin this term. Um, I, I I wanted something that would be easy for us to reason about, um, uh, or reason aboutable, as we say. Um, so what does you know like what kind of tool can satisfy these requirements? Um, what kind of uh, what kind of database do we need? Well, how do we network? Well, it turns out that we already have a solution in our toolkit um, that most of us use here and most of us know very well, and it's called Redux. Um, and um, no, again, you're like, hey, dude, this is 2017. You know, like this is not React London 2015. What are you talking about? Um, but the thing is, Redux gets a bad rap these days. There's a, you know, since Mobex came out and since the whole set state gate happening right now on Twitter. Um, like people are, are dragging on Redux, but the thing about you know, like the biggest criticism is that there's too much boilerplate, there's too much ceremony, um, too much kind of work to be done. But like any argument that is based on measuring lines of code, I feel like it misses one crucial point, which is that we don't use Redux um, to make simple things easy. We use Redux to make really, really complex things simple, and and that's the um, that's the key idea. So complex problems like offline first is, uh, is something that this Redux is, uh, is, is a great tool for. Um, we don't have time now to go into the full um, architecture, but the basic idea is that your Redux store is your database. Um, you don't need a database product. You just need a way to serialize it and uh, put it to disk and read it back later. So in the browser, we can use local storage or IndexedDB. In, um, in um, React Native, we can use ASIC storage or any custom, uh, custom database. Um, then you need some middleware that is able to, uh, you know, do the networking reliably um, without you having to kind of like do the complex orchestration around retries and, and detecting network states. Um, and then finally, we just need a lot, a lot of glue code um, around uh, taking actions that happen offline, uh, putting them in a, in a queue, and then uh, synchronizing or reconciling those effects with the backend later. So Andre had a, like, a, like a holistic solution to this problem where like, he's really like, trying to approach the whole problem of synchronization. Um, like Andre comes from Russia, I come from Finland. Uh, you know, his, his country is big and ambitious, mine is small and you know, sort of humble. Uh, uh, so this solution is small and, hum small and humble, but it's basically the same solution you're already using. Um, and I've done this like, ad hoc in multiple apps now. Um, uh, I've used things like Redux Persist, Redux Optimist, um, great libraries, but still a lot of glue code and not obvious how to use them. 
So that's why today I'm really happy um, to put out something that I've been thinking about for a long time but never got around doing, um, which is Redux offline. So it's a library that basically takes this pattern and formalizes it um, via documentation and via library, like via actual code, um, so you can use it in your own apps. Um, so really briefly, the idea of Redux offline is that you replace your regular create store from Redux just with create offline store, and things magically work, um, which is fantastic, uh, except of course they don't. So um, that's why like, we allow for configuring every bit of um, every bit of the kind of experience, like how do we detect network, how do we send things, how do we retry things, how do we batch things, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I see some pictures, uh, people taking pictures of this code. Uh, this library is so new that I already rewrote this API since I made these slides. So, uh, um, so yeah, don't, don't try to code that. Anyway, so the way you use this is it's quite simple. After you've configured it um, the way you want, um, you basically just decorate your actions in Redux with an offline meta tag that, needs, that describes the full context of what happened to that action over time. What effect does it need to cause over network in another system? Uh, what happens when it succeeds when you commit this transaction um, or when you roll it back? And you can use these like three simple things, the effect, commit, and rollback, to make pessimistic UI, make optimistic UI, or basically just cause any sort of persistent effect or uh, like effect that can be persisted and transactionally continued later. Um, but that was a lot of boilerplate code, but if you look at it, it's really just, if you use action creators, it's just an action that contains two more actions. Like it's not any more complicated than that. And your state updates are basically exactly the same code you do in your normal Redux application. The actions just get dispatched at some point later. Um, so I'll leave you with this. Um, Redux offline is now available on GitHub near you. Um, it's super raw, like there's a saying of make it work, make it great, make it fast. I think Redux offline is currently the stage of make it, period. Um, and it's up to you to uh, be my QA and, and, and see if it actually works. It's based on battle-tested ideas. It's based on ideas that we've successfully um, implemented both on the web and on React Native, where Redux Offline works. Um, but the implementation of it is about, you know, it, it's not very well tested yet. Um, but what I hope to do is to make this a solution that can benefit all the people who are gonna go on this journey of making their first offline first applications. Um, so that for that reason, um, it's not only code, like I said, it's documentation. Um, so I've published an offline first guide. It's in the GitHub repo, um, which you can either type up or you can uh, follow me on Twitter and uh, I'll be posting more materials around it, including a full text of this talk in a blog post format so you can take it home and read it. Um, so thank you. How do you manage storing big states in Redux object? So yes, obviously this um, architecture has a trade-off, is that if your state does not fit in memory, um, it's not a good idea for you to use that as your kind of like a main database. But essentially what the Redux state becomes is like a read-through cache. Like if it wouldn't fit in memory, you wouldn't put it there anyway. Um, regarding serialization, um, so we, uh, we use, uh, under the hood, we use the library called Redux Persist that has a lot of clever optimizations around uh, how the state is kind of serialized in chunks um, and it uses arrays instead of objects because those are faster to, faster to serialize and deserialize, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what if in your store there are sensitive informations you don't want to save in your local storage? Um, that's a really great question. So Redux Persist, it turns out like most of it was actually done by some other guy. Um, Redux Persist uh, has an um, idea of, of, um, of like plugins um, or transforms. So there's two things that can help you here. It has the transform for encryption, so you can actually encrypt your state and put it into local storage. And then it also has a filter transform that allows you to filter sensitive like any part of your state and not persist that bit. Um, how about fetching data from a server? Um, a really good question again. So this is where like Andres Logux really kind of shines. Um, not that the data fetching part, but it, uh, that it has an opinion about, about this channel, like how do you 
fetch your data. Redux offline doesn't at all. So it's kind of your responsibility. Like if you need to fetch, for example, some data after a successful action happens or in the beginning of the app, that's your um, your responsibility. But the thing I really want to stress here, and the idea that I really, you know, I really like the guiding principle behind creating something a library like that is not to come up with like a magnificent amount of like code and architecture and, and you know, like sort of implementation that will solve every problem. I wanted to just keep it so close to the, your existing experience um, writing Redux apps so I don't have any opinion about how do you fetch data. The default implementation is just like for reconciling the effects back to the server. It's a simple fetch, like a browser fetch, but you can override that with a single line of code. Um, What's the best offline feature this is allowed to build? Okay, so this is gonna be my last, last uh, answer, um, and this is so dope, you, you guys have no idea. So we built this app. Um, and and it, so, so basically the idea is that we, we, it was a React Native app based in Redux, um, and it was an app that was used by people who regularly work like underground and work in, in places where they have no network, but they needed to be able to continue their workflow um, as normally. Um, so, so we built this with you know, something like Redux Offline, uh, the, one of the earlier precursors of the architecture, and that worked fine. But then we got to the point where, how do we um, synchronize, um, like how do we show errors, like when an error happens, and the user needs to go and correct something that they have done maybe two days ago. Like how do we contextualize that information for them? It's a really hard UX problem to solve in general. So what we did is that because the action, the persistent action contains the full, uh, full context of data and we can put whatever we want there, we took a snapshot of our, that particular mobile app state, um, like the navigation state in React, uh, React Native, we stored it with that, and then when the um, error happened, we could actually return the user the exact same screen where they were wh when they took the action, no matter where they took it. So if we had five different buttons and five different screens that did all the same action, it always took them to the place where they um, where they did it. So I don't know about you, but you know, like as a bit of a UX nerd, like that's the kind of stuff that really gets me off. So thank you. <laughs>